Good evening and welcome to Talk of the Neighborhoods. I'm Joe Heisler, your host, coming to you from the BNN Live studios, Eggleston Square, Jamaica Plain, where tonight on the Boston Neighborhood Network, well, we'll bring you our usual healthy dose of politics in a couple of different flavors. First up tonight, we'll get the latest from Boston City Hall with a guy that always seems to have his finger on the pulse there, just so happens to be the uh, District, uh, uh, District 6 City Councilor from uh, Jamaica Plain, West Roxbury, and old friend as well, Matt O'Malley joins us. Then in the second half, we'll shift gears. We'll give you a preview of the upcoming Environmental Film Festival, as we do every year. Uh, Dr. Ricky Stern, the executive director from E-Inc., joins us to uh, talk about the uh, lineup of shows uh, coming up. And you'll get all the details and more on Talk of the Neighborhood. All right, we're back with Talk of the Neighborhoods. I'm Joe Heisler, your host. Tonight, a two-part show, and as is our usual want, uh, we can't stay away from Boston City Hall, especially with a new mayor and a new council just uh, sworn in at the beginning of the year. Joining us tonight, an old friend, a guy who uh, seems to have his hand, his fingers in everything up there. Uh, he is, of course, the uh, District 6 City Councilor from Jamaica Plain, West Roxbury. We're talking, of course... Matt O'Malley. And Matt, nice to have you here. Thanks Always so great to be with you, Thanks Joe. Thanks for coming in, my friend. No, uh, my pleasure. And go Bruins. Uh, go Bruins. Uh, well, they didn't start out too well, but uh, we'll see how the uh, the rest of the game goes. Um, uh, let's start out with you. Now, uh, I, I know at the beginning of the year, you toyed with the idea of uh, even running for president of the Boston City Council, but uh, uh, you decided uh, ultimately against that or pulled the... Yeah, we, we tried to put something together, came pretty close, um, ultimately a little short. Uh, so uh, it's just great to, to be back, uh, obviously. Uh, it's an re exciting council, re-elected, uh, thankfully, and uh, honored to have the opportunity to serve my neighbors and, and the people, neighborhoods that I know and love. What are your committees this year? What will be your priorities uh, in this uh, two-year term? Yeah, I was named chair of the uh, Environment and Parks Committee. Uh, we have, have had a long-standing environment committee. I had asked to include parks because I think we have such a, a wonderful uh, park system in the city, and we need to be doing more and encouraging uh, people to use them more in youth athletic leagues and, and older athletic leagues, just getting people out there. Uh, additionally, I'm the vice chair of the uh, Education Committee. We actually had a hearing earlier tonight that I had to duck out a little bit early from um, and serve on the Ways and Means, which is the main budget writing, mm -hmm. or the committee that oversees the mayor's budget, uh, government operations, which I was proud to uh, chair for two years. So mm -hmm. uh, it's really exciting. Well, and uh, of course, you got a new mayor and you got uh, somebody new to work with. You've sure. been accustomed to working with Mayor Menino. Uh, how's this working out? How's uh, Mayor Walsh doing up there now? You were. Uh, uh, supporter of, uh, of John Conway, sure. of course, who was your neighbor. What yeah. kind of neighbor would you be if you weren't? Yeah, but yeah. Uh, how, has that put you in a difficult position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the new mayor? Not at all. I, I think Mayor Walsh is doing an incredible job. I really think his strength uh, that that people with whom he served in the legislature throughout his campaign for mayor and now in the early months of his administration, uh, his strength is just his collaborative approach to politics. Um, you know, we've already sat down on numerous occasions. He's been a terrific uh, leader in the city. He's been very open and accessible. He's surrounded himself with some incredibly bright, uh, talented, dedicated mm -hmm. people. Uh, and it's been great. You know, we are incredibly grateful uh, for Mayor Menino and, and, and the fact that he left this city in a far better and stronger position mm -hmm. after 20 years. Uh, but it's also exciting to work with some new energy and some new blood, and I think Mayor Walsh is uh, doing a, a fantastic job. Well, of course, uh, one of uh, his uh, first priorities was rolling out a new budget, which sure. uh, you folks got a, a look at here just within the past couple of weeks. Uh, are, are his priorities, though, your priorities? No. What, what do you see in there, and what... Uh, what did you like? What don't you like? Sure. Yeah, no, I would absolutely say that, that the priorities reflect in the mayor's budget um, are certainly ones that I agree, and I would venture a guess that all my colleagues agree with the per, per, pretty much everyone watching this program. A real focus on education. It's by far the largest percentage of our budget. Uh, it's a $2.7 billion budget, and, you know, education accounts for about more than $900 million of that. Um, as well as public safety, making sure we have funds for new recruit class, for police, fire, and EMS. As I've said, I really want to focus on the park system and some new playing mm -hmm. playgrounds, playing fields, uh, community pools, community centers, libraries. So it, it, it's all there. We're in the midst of the budget process. Uh, the council received it as a docket in April. We've already had dozens, uh, several dozen hearings. Um, 
and that will continue through June. And uh, it's it's actually an, perhaps the most important role this council plays, just going over everything uh, through our Ways and Means Committee, through other committees that have been uh, part of the process, just going over everything and making sure that we have a strong, uh, robust, uh, financially responsible budget. Mm -hmm. Of course, every uh, councillor, every, especially every district councillor, uh, likes to bring home a little something, and of course, it's it's not your budget. Sure. But uh, uh, do you see things in there that uh, weren't included that you maybe wanted to, or things in particular that you've been working on for a while that uh, may now come to fruition? Sure, I, I think several things are, and it really, um, for some of them, the process began under Mayor Menino, and these things can take three, four, five years. Yeah, so those capital budget. Absolutely, so. a five-year document. Um, one is the full renovation of the Jamaica Plain Branch Library. We had the budget hearing on libraries this morning. Uh, the Sedgwick Street Branch, which is a 102 or 103-year-old branch library, mm -hmm. is getting its full, uh, a full renovation, the first in decades. Uh, Millennium Park over in West Roxbury, which is an area I know you know well, uh, was a landfill up until the year 2000 when it became a incredible 100-acre uh, playing field and park gorgeous. and open, open space. It absolutely is gorgeous, one of the best kept secrets oh. in the city. Uh, and I'm happy that, you know, one thing I advocated for with Mayor Menino and Mayor Walsh is, is bringing uh, to fruition is phase two, which will now take some of the uh, land near West, the old West Roxbury High School, the educational right. complex, and put in a turf football field. Uh, tennis courts, basketball courts, a baseball diamond, a softball diamond. So these are the large, you know, multi-million dollar projects that um, I'm very happy to see are included in the budget. And we've been working with advocates and stakeholders to make sure that they get funded. Well, of course, uh, uh, being re-elected to the council, and uh, I, I know that was uh, <clears throat> one of your dreams when you were a young man working sure back in the, uh, the hall, the hill days. Uh, uh, you've got some new faces. You're yep. no longer the... Uh, uh, fresh uh, yeah. young, while well, you I'm are the grizzly fresh, old veteran, you now. are fresh and young still, <laughs> Matt. But uh, uh, you've got some new, literally some new faces. Well, some new, and in one case, one new old face. Sure. Uh, of course, Michael Flaherty. But uh, uh, give us some sense of uh, how that might have changed the council. Uh, can you tell yet? Or uh... yeah, I, I think the the four new councilors, uh, including Michael Flaherty, who of course served for, for with distinction for ten years and, and came back after a couple of term um, absence, uh, Michelle Wu, another at large councilor, mm -hmm. Tim McCarthy, who's taking over, filling the very big shoes from Rob Consalvo and Josh Sakem, also filling mm -hmm. the big shoes of Michael uh, Ross. Great individuals, really talented. Um, they all bring unique perspectives to the position um, and sort of work they've done up until this point. Um, and you know, we are a big uh, family on the council. Sometimes we can be a dysfunctional <laughs> family, as every family can. Uh, but given the fact Squ it's just a few squabbles now and here then. and there, you know, yeah. it's Boston, it's politics. Yeah. Uh, but just given the fact that we're a small legislative body, 13 members. Yeah. Um, you know, we all work, uh, I think, well and in, in, in interact with one another and, and appreciate the point of view that everyone has brought. Um, having said that, we lost uh, four really committed counselors, all of whom ran for mayor unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, they've all left big shoes to fill, but I think our, our new colleagues and our returning colleague are, are uh, more than up for the task and have already all hit the ground running with mm -hmm. just different initiatives uh, and a real focus and, and uh, seriousness of purpose that I think that this body deserves. Is it, uh, would you, and it's an oversimplification, but is it a more progressive council, you think, uh, now? Is it, uh, um, I notice, you know, some of the, uh, of course, you always have some, some interesting resolutions that are sure. put forth. Uh, uh, I'm thinking of uh, uh, something that you might not have seen a few years ago, but uh, uh, the commission to focus on the needs of, you know, uh, African American men, sure. for instance, or, or something like that. Is that a sign of uh, of kind of changing priorities on the council? Well, I don't know that it's a sign. That that particular piece of legislation yeah. was uh, from Tito Jackson, who who right. joined the body. Who was about here three and months. talked about this? Yeah, incidentally. it's a great yeah. thing. Proud to co-sponsor. Yeah. He came three months after I did, and it's I'm now in my third. Yeah. We're both in our third years. Um, no, I, th I think the body more than sort of ide ideology. We're taking the job more seriously. We all know we're both students of history. We've both followed these, mm -hmm. this, uh, this body and local politics for a while. Um, we all know stories of the 70s, the 60s and 70s, and, and battles on the council and fistfights oftentimes. I think one thing we've seen over the last decade plus are counselors really focusing more on the constituent service aspect, which is key. 
uh, as well as the issues that are germane to the residents uh, in the city of Boston. So by focusing on those important issues, I think the councils become stronger and better and, and a, a uh, more uh, equitable voice uh, working with the mayor uh, as the city's legislative body. Well, here's an uh, issue from out of the past, so it's not so far past, but at once it was, uh, might have been the most hot button issue in the city, uh, residency. Mm. And uh, uh, I know that uh, 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 Councillor Flaherty and, and some others, and you, I'm not sure if you were on that bill or not, uh, introduced a, uh, uh, a piece of legislation that would uh, establish uh, uh, that you must be a resident for three years to uh, get on the police or fire departments. And uh, uh, does that uh, still resonate with councillors? Is that uh, likely to be a big issue, a contentious issue? I don't know if it's contentious. Um, it certainly did resonate. Um, you know, I have have a record of really uh, having some uh, real concerns about the residency requirement mm -hmm. as it stands for the simple reason I want the best and brightest workforce in the city of Boston at all levels. And I don't know that we need rules that could um, prohibit that. Or make it more difficult, mm -hmm. I guess, is a better uh, yeah, Although there it. are some rules in place right now, still. Oh, certainly there are. Yeah. Um, and many have, through the uh, contract negotiations, have been you know, used as a, as a bargaining chip, for right. lack of a better word. Um, so I, I do recognize um, the importance and the value of having uh, particularly Boston public school graduates or those who live here access to these jobs. Um, and I think that we'll have a hearing and figure out more about Council of Flaherty's plan on this and, and how he foresees mm -hmm. it and, and how the, um, the different collective bargaining units see it. Uh, but a, as a rule, I just think residency, you know, it's more important to have the most well-qualified mm -hmm. uh, residents who may live here or may come from elsewhere. Um, but it certainly has been an issue and, you know, will continue to be an issue. Well, here's another issue that just kind of won't go away and there's good good cause for it. We're talking about... Uh, Casino gambling. Mm. Now I know when this whole discussion started, you were uh, kind of uh, way out on the edge. Yeah. But uh, it almost seems like this argument has come full circle, at least as uh, as uh, Mayor Walsh has weighed in here. Uh, any satisfaction in that? Quiet satisfaction? Maybe. I don't, I don't know if it's satisfaction. <laughs> uh, I agree with the mayor. Um, and just for you know those at home watching, uh, the, the way the legislation was written with casinos was that if a city had a population of greater than 125,000 people, mm -hmm. there would be a ward-only vote unless the city municipal body uh, voted and acted otherwise. Right. I wrote a, uh, a, a bill, an amendment to the language that would allow for a citywide vote. Um, two other councillors, Councillor Yancey and Councillor Jackson, supported me on that. Uh, they were the only two. It failed. Uh, so then when the vote came on a ward-only vote, I was the lone vote against it. It was a 12 to 1 vote. Mm. And I really wear that proudly. Um, I believe that any casino will clearly, no doubt it will impact, it, it will take Suffolk Downs, for example, it will no doubt impact East Boston more than other neighborhoods. Sure. But you cannot deny the fact that it will change the fabric of the city. And we all pay property taxes that go to uh, infrastructure improvements, that go to uh, gambling services and addiction that go to public safety aspects of it. So it would affect the entire city. Every neighbor in the city should have had a vote. Uh, I was unsuccessful with that, but the way things are looking now, I think Mayor Walsh is correct in saying that although the Everett site, it will clearly affect Charlestown, and the Suffolk Down site, which has been, the bl whole blueprint has right. been changed, so it's no longer in the city of Boston, will affect East Boston. That was precisely the argument that I was making, that a neighborhood or a city or a town border shouldn't necessarily dictate what the effects will be when it will affect so much more. So I, I uh, am glad that the mayor is calling for a, a vote. Uh, I would certainly, you know, should we get to that point, again, push for a citywide vote because this will change the city. Um, well, it's certainly question. not 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 clear at this point. And actually now, in fact, the uh, focus has uh, shifted a little bit. Uh, mayor Walsh uh, suggested that... Uh, 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 Steve Crosby, the chairman of the uh, gambling racing yep. board, whatever we're calling it, uh, uh, has a bias against the city of Boston. Do you believe that? I don't know if it's a bias. Uh, and, and let me say, Steve Crosby is a constituent. He's mm -hmm. someone uh, of whom I have a tremendous respect. He's served this state well in a number of capacities. Um, but by virtue of some of the decisions that he has made, some of the things that we've read about in the newspaper, 
Uh, he recused himself from the, right, um, the decision. decision last week, and it was a four to nothing decision. I think having done that, and that was the wise choice for him to do, I do think, again, I respect the man, but I think that he should step down from the board. You cannot recuse yourself from these major decisions. It then makes a five-person board vote a mm -hmm. four-person board vote. If there's a tie in that, there's nothing to address that, as far as I know. Um, so again, I thank Steve Crosby. I think he's a good man. Um, I don't question his integrity, but I think given the admitted um, Perceived conflict of interest, perceived or otherwise, uh, I think it is time that he steps down. And well, that as be uh, did uh, several of the gubernatorial candidates, uh, we shall see. Again, that story uh, uh, developing. Uh, joining us in this segment, Matt O'Malley, he's the District 6 City Councilor. We've got a few minutes left with him. Uh, uh, speaking of that, of course, uh, the uh, Democratic Convention is coming yeah. up, and uh, well, there's a lot of choices out there. there are. And, uh, a lot of people wooing a counselor from West Roxbury and Jamaica Plain, <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing as well. Uh, I, I know, I, you know, city councilors are nonpartisan offices, sure. but uh, certainly uh, Boston is a bastion of the Democratic Party. And do you find yourself uh, being pulled uh, different ways here? Have you endorsed in the race? I, I've endorsed. Uh, I've, I endorsed Steve Grossman for governor. Yeah. Uh, he is someone um, that I really consider a friend and a mentor. He's someone I, I first met Steve Grossman when I was a uh, sophomore in college at George Washington University. He was chair of the DNC at the time and came to speak. And remember chatting with him afterwards, letting him know I was from Boston. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we've stayed in touch since then. I was his field director in the. Uh, treasurer's race in 2010 mm -hmm. left to pursue the seat when there was a special election for District yeah. 6. Um, and I think he just has uh, a tremendous background in the public sector as treasurer and receiver general, in the private sector running a small business. So I think uh, he's exactly what we need. Having said that, there are other candidates running mm -hmm. uh, statewide uh, for governor who have done tremendous work. It's going to be an exciting race. Some, we have four constitutional offices opened. I can't remember the last time that happened. Well. Um, you know, Mara Healy, another person who's running for Attorney General, someone who's uh, impressed me, and, and, and um, just so many other candidates. So it'll be an exciting, uh, well, exciting fall. Well, um, of course, uh, some people suggesting it may not matter who the Democrats <laughs> nominate this year. Uh, after uh, nearly eight years of Deval Patrick, uh, there's some thought that uh, you know the Republicans, uh, this may be their year to kind of swoop back in office. What's your sense uh, from the community, from voters out there? Are they uh, uh, tired, and uh, could that spell uh, uh, difficulties for Democrats this year? You know, I'll, I'll take off my Democratic elected official hat and put on the role I sat with you many yeah. times before I was elected as sort of a strategist. It, there's no question that, that in an off-year election, uh, Republicans will have some strength. And Charlie Baker, I think, is running a good, a good, not a great, a good campaign uh, for governor. Uh, it seems to be Charlie version 2.0, the kinder, gentler Charlie mm -hmm. Baker, and it seems to be more reminiscent of, many, I don't know the man, but many people who know him say that he didn't come across as well as he is or should have four years ago. Um, I, I think Governor Patrick's done a great job, I, so I don't th think that you'll have some of that national winds of um, resistance that you may in some other states. Uh, it will be a close race, uh, depending on, on whom we nominate. Um, and, you know, Massachusetts, although a blue bastion of progressiveness and, and liberalism um, did have a record from 1990 to 2006 right. of of, uh, of electing Republican governors and Charlie seems to be in that mold I mean he worked for Paul Salucci and, so it's and not out of the realm. yeah so it, it'll be a, it'll be a close race um, but ultimately I still think uh, a Democrat uh, will pull it off and remain in the corner office well speaking of running I, I, I got to ask you about this because every year I of course uh, see your uh, uh, your Facebook, your, uh, yeah. uh, you run the Boston Marathon, and I mean, this year especially had to be, uh, uh, you know, very emotional. I know you uh, raised money for charity yeah. and doing it, and uh, I applaud you for that, but uh, uh, what makes Matt <laughs> O'Malley run like that? That's a grueling thing, and could you feel the difference this year? Because Without I'm question. It was... Dave McGilvery, who's the race director for the BAA, mm -hmm. for Dave McGilvery Sports, for the race, um, said it wasn't a good race, it wasn't a great race, it was epic. And he was absolutely right on the money. 
This was my seventh marathon, my sixth Boston. I typically do it every other year, a non-election mm -hmm. year. So I, I didn't run last year, although I was at Cleveland Circle wait, waiting for Team Hoyt, Rick and Dick Hoyt, two of yeah. my favorites, uh, when the bombs went off. Um, and it was just incredibly emotional. I do it because I love it. Uh, it's such an opportunity. It's such a great running city. I started running in college. My first marathon was the Marine Corps Marathon in 2001, uh, about five weeks, at, five or six weeks after 9/11, um, and much of that route goes around the Pentagon. So it was still incredibly emotional. I thought I will never experience a race as emotional as this, and sadly, I was wrong, uh, given the events of last year. But this year's race is exactly what we need. The crowd, it was, it was the second biggest field in history of, of BAA, with the 100th anniversary right. being the exception. We had an extra 9,000 runners. The crowd seemed to be triple what they usually are. Uh, bandits, who typically we have to deal with, those who aren't registered who <laughs> run in the back, they took the year off to respect the race. Um, every stride that we took from Hopkinton to Boylston Street, we were thinking of those three vic four victims, three of the day, and then Officer Collier several days after on everyone that was hurt and just to see people themselves who were at the finish line who had been hurt were either running or on the route cheering us on was incredibly emotional and really showed uh, the world how strong the city is and, and what the term Boston Strong means. Um, it was just an honor to get to be a part of it. Well, uh, you know, it's a, a, it's a great achievement, individual achievement, but uh, certainly this year really was mm -hmm. and the weather, of course, cooperated as sure. well and it's like uh, uh, a great day, and let's uh, let's hope that's a sign of uh, peaceful days to come. Absolutely. But uh, as always, Matt O'Malley, we enjoyed talking with you. Uh, continue your good work. Thank Thanks you, for Joe. coming Thank by you for and all joining you us tonight. Uh, when we return with more of Talking the Neighbors, well, we'll shift gears um, to our annual preview of the Environmental Film Festival here in Boston, and we've got some. Uh, uh, shorts, some trailers to show you, and of course, uh, joining us, Dr. Ricky Stern, the executive director of E Inc., the educational nonprofit that sponsors the film festival. So I'm Joe Heisler, your host, and in this segment, uh, we'll do our annual preview of the Environmental Film Festival here in Boston. That's uh, uh, Sunday, May 18th, and joining us, uh, an old friend. Uh, the executive director of E Incorporated, the uh, educational nonprofit. We're talking about Dr. Ricky Stern. Nice to have Hi, you. Hi, thanks always, for thanks, having me. Thanks Jim. so much for coming back. Great to be well, here. Well, this is uh, really building up to quite an event. I know you've been working in the, this field for you know nearly a dozen years, but uh, the film festival, and we love having it. And incidentally, we've got lots of uh, uh, trailers, uh, trailers <laughs> to show everyone t tonight, yeah. but. Uh, has uh, the environmental movement, uh, uh, you know, every time, of course, you, there's another freak storm or yeah. event that, uh, are, are you getting more people and more and more people? I know you've been talking about this for a long time, uh, climate change, sustainability, carbon footprint. Uh, uh, are people finally starting to you get know, it? It's funny that you say that because I actually, this last few months, for the first time, I started to feel a zeitgeist kind of showing up, you yeah. know. For years, it's always been that sense of pushing against uh, right. and trying to get folks to open their eyes, and we are comfortable as people. And I think when we're most comfortable, we kind of want to just pretend the raft won't go over, you right. know. But of course, um, the information is so clear, so stark, and even, you know, the president comes out and discusses all the stuff mm -hmm. that's come out of those last reports and had one of its own, his own. Um, I think you're starting to see that it's easier to talk about it in, you know, finally in schools. People are thinking about sustainability mm -hmm. in their buildings. There's a sense that it's it's coming of age, as it were, and that, frankly, not a moment too soon. This is a very serious set of issues. Well, and I know you've been working with young people uh, yeah. for all these years, uh, trying to get them to focus. How, how have you been doing? Have you been having success? I know you going to classrooms, you, well, you do all kinds of things. Uh, this is just uh, um, one of the highlights of what you do. Right, this is, this is we call the, I mean, just to segue, just to say on the side, that we, I sort of see the film festival as like adult ed. Right. You know, we don't reach out to adults as much. Um, and uh, it used to be, I would, people would say, well, you know, they're there, you're teaching the kids, they'll be, you know, the next generation. Right. But I realized in a way, it's very hard to get people who don't believe in something to believe in it. Something has to happen to them to make them believe. So now I'm really seeing that the more we get kids involved, the more, I, uh, the more our curricula improve, the more we get 
focus on exactly how to deliver services. Um, I hear more and more stories from my staff of kids that harass their parents and want things at home and ask the teacher how come this is plugged in. What, what everything they're zoning in on that lets them think about making a difference, taking uh, responsibility. And that's, that's a piece of what we're after uh, since the beginning. How many kids now, and, and I know you have a, you know, a curricula that you can do at various schools, but yeah. how many schools are you in now? Yeah. What kinds of things are you doing there? So uh, about three years ago, we thought, uh, we went to the idea that even though the after-school programs we've been doing for, you know, forever were fabulous and we have a lovely roster of mm -hmm. after-schools, um, we felt that, the, that it, systemically, if you want to take a systems theory perspective, you want to stop and say, What's the biggest bang for your buck? And to us, we decided the school systems were a huge win if you could make it happen because teachers, if they care about it, will care about it for several groups of mm -hmm. kids. An entire building can be helped to move in a certain direction. Parents then see it. And every family in a community that is, is you know, that has a kid is in that system. Mm -hmm. So you can reach so many people that maybe aren't educated in the science or haven't um, had any pressure before to rethink, and now the kids come home and say, well, you've got to unplug that, Mom, you know? Right. And that's how it starts, you know, awareness. Well, uh, again, uh, Dr. Ricky Stern is the executive director of E Incorporated, and uh, their annual event uh, coming up uh, this Sunday, that would be May 18th, the Environmental Film Festival. Uh, Always great fun, and uh, tell us uh, more about that. Now, I, we've got some trailers that we'll go through, but uh, tell us, give us a little idea of the day. Of what's going on. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, we've come up with a really nice structure. Uh, some people complained last year that they couldn't get to a second film if they wanted to, so we just divided the entire day into a morning session. By morning, I mean 11. So an 11, <coughs> sorry, 11 to 1 session and a 2.30 to 4.30. Everything's tea accessible. They're all in the uh, downtown area. The furthest one is right to the edge of Chinatown mm -hmm. and the beginning of the South End. And so folks will have no trouble going to two films if that's what they choose to do. The second thing to say is that every showing has some shorts that are just, you know, lovely warm things that we picked mm -hmm. up uh, from the Wild and Scenic Film Festival in California that we have a partnership with. And then we have begun to show documentaries with every uh, showing. So we have eight documentaries. We're trying to appeal to a wide array of audiences. So there are some about issues going on for different wildlife. There are some about chemicals and the concerns people are feeling about um, all the substances we don't understand in so many things in our lives. And then there are films, uh, there's a film about soil, which you think, oh, what are they doing? <laughs> you know, what's that about? Right, exactly. And when, when somebody got, gave this film to me as a, uh, uh, to check it out, I thought, all right, you know, gee, asked. I said, we were glued. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. It was so fascinating. So you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> so if they want to come and see, again, we'll go through the films here. Uh, we've got some trailers, but... Uh, how can they get tickets? Mm. Uh, how do they go? How do they access it? Uh... A lot of places have, if you're going to take a car, tis tis, then you have a uh, parking lot nearby for most of the venues. Uh, our museum space is doing showings down in Charlestown Navy Yard. Then um, there are, it's the south end of Castle Square, uh, but really just to say the tickets. Uh, the tickets are online. You just go to our website, which is wwwe action. Dot US, and then you just click on right. the film festival, it takes you right to the site. And I think we have it up there, and we'll flash it a, a few more times. Great, All great, right, great. tell us what we're going to see here. The first one uh, I'm looking at, uh, From Billions to None. Yes. Can you give so us a little preview a late, of this, and then we have a, a clip from this. So let me say, this is a late comer to the festival, and it is literally hot off the presses. It was shown at a conference in a, in a raw state, and people already were. Um, you know, just saying great things about it. I got some calls about it. So we found the filmmaker in uh, Chicago, David uh, Mrazek, and he is telling the story of the passenger pigeon. Billions of beings that would come, when they were approaching a field to glean, they would empty that field in an hour, and people said it sounded like a huge train approaching. There were so many of them. And so it really was billions of beings, and we have none That's left. That's right, they're extinct. Yeah, they're well, extinct. Uh, I think we have the clip and we can run uh, run that. It's uh, 
from billions to none. We can roll that. Let's imagine a flock that's a mile wide and 200 miles long. And the front birds are coming down to glean from the field. And imagine being ahead of this crashing wave of biology working its way up the center of the continent. And the eruption of wings, it was so loud that these men with guns were terrified. There were tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of passenger pigeons. And we lost it from billions to none in a matter of a few decades. It was us. We're the ones who made that happen. Incomprehensible. That's something we think can't happen. We are killing about 100 million sharks per year. That means about 11,000 every hour. It's absolutely unsustainable. And it can happen to the bluefin tuna. It can happen to the polar bear. It can happen to the wolf. The extinction of passenger pigeon species was pretty well marked. It was September 1st, 1914. This abundant bird um, ceased to exist. Well, it's my job to bring the passenger pigeon back to life. If extinction isn't forever, a lot changes. I live every day thinking about how could this go wrong. In today's world, we could never recreate the natural phenomenon that was the passenger pigeon. Let's remember what we once had and use that as a way to think about today and to think about tomorrow. Billions to none. Fascinating. Yeah. Passenger pigeons. What a story. Who would have uh, thought it? But uh, all right. And that's uh, showing at uh, uh, all of the venues you have, or just this one? One, uh, one and I'm, I'm going to be embarrassed if I say the wrong thing. So I think I'll just suggest yeah, to people it's, uh, go to the that website. it's online. Yeah, go to the it's website. an afternoon film. Oh, I know. Wait, it's at the Goethe. Yeah. The Goethe Institute, because I'm now remembering that we're getting this fabulous guy, Scott Edwards from. Uh, the, uh, he's the ornithologist, chief ornithologist at Harvard Zoology uh, Museum, and he'll speak. Wow. Yeah, very exciting. So uh, a little, uh, not just film, but uh, lecture as well. Okay, yeah. the next one we have, uh, Growing Cities. Tell us about that. Well, this is one of those, there's always one film in the environment movement every year where two guys get into a car and look for something <laughs> across the country. So this year we're looking at farming. And these two guys jump in a car and they go to all these great places looking at how is, how is farming going on in cities. It's about urban farming and the, the extra lot, the pocket park, mm -hmm. the people on their terraces, what's going on? And, you know, it's actually a really good news story. It's a lot of fun. People are devoted. And I, I did, and they're just a cute duo in opening up All this right. idea. And we have a, uh, a uh, trailer of this as well, if we can run that. I think for the way the world is going right now, we just need to grow more food. 80% of the people in the United States now live in cities. They have to be fed. Since cities first began 12,000 years ago, there's always been agriculture practiced in cities. Anyone anywhere should be able to grow and provide food for their community because everywhere there are eaters and everywhere there's at least a little bit of land. An urban farmer is somebody who's growing food somewhere. It can be in their window box, it can be on a roof, in a baseball field or football field. It can be in any of those spaces. There's a great importance in making sure that the next generation has the tools they need to feed themselves. It's more than just something you can kind of do with kids because it's fun. It's an economic engine. We have this tremendous potential for reimagining how the land is used, and one of those uses should be urban agriculture. Atlanta, Georgia today at the Funny Farm. We're at the headquarters for Window Farms. My head is about three inches away from the cheese. Changing all my strings, I'm gonna write another traveling song. A 
about all the billion highways. My name is Will Allen. My name is Raj Perry. My name is Carolyn. My name is Anastasia. My name is Katie Bell. My name is Antonio Nicholas. My name is Sean. My name is Adam Hill. My name is Jeanette Bale. And I'm Caitlin. And we're urban farmers. We're not asking people to grow everything. We're saying grow something. Grow where you are. Okay, again, that's growing cities. Now, the next one, and I, I you know, you got my my uh, curiosity going here, Symphony of the Soil. Yeah, yeah, so well, you know what, we'll just, uh, let me say real fast that uh, somebody told me about this, I saw it and I thought, oh God, this, this is gonna be sleep a sleeper, but I'll look at it because they asked me to. This is a beautiful movie, you don't wanna miss it, it's right. just gorgeous. Symphony of the Soil, we can roll this. Most of the planet is not living. It's mineral, it's never known life, it's just this rock, and yet soil starts forming on it and creates this very thin layer where life is possible. Soil is the interface between biology and geology. It's sort of the living skin of the earth. and you start looking at it, it's a place full of life. We can go down thousands of years at this. This hasn't been shaped by life yet. Many of the elements have been washed out of the soil because it's so wet here. We make about 200 to 300 yards of our own compost every year. We don't grow plants, we grow soil, and soil grows plants. This soil just goes down and down and down and down and down. Deep, rich, now it didn't start off like that. You cannot have good flavor without that kind of uh, attention to detail and, and knowledge of the biology. If we have declared a war against the soil itself, then we are literally committing a species level suicide. And. The only thing that I can see that really looks promising is to get back to the fundamentals of the soil. The soil returns to what it was like when it was first broken out. So alive and so vital. Fascinating. Yeah. That's called the Symphony of the Soil. Now, we've got two more, and I want to get through these. Yeah, the yeah. next one is the Human Experiment. So um, there is now, I think, more and more a, an understanding that almost none of the chemicals uh, in the country that aren't, cons unless they're being consumed, are actually regulated, which is shocking. And uh, it, I read uh, that article about uh, the disaster of the chemical spill in um, the New Yorker. I had an article about two weeks ago, three yeah. weeks ago. Unbelievable what we don't know. Yeah. So this film is about that, what we don't, what know. We don't know. about And the chemicals. activism that's going on around that is very good. Okay, and it's called The Human Experiment, if we can roll that. diagnosed at 37 with invasive ductal carcinoma, stage two. My cancer wanted to move. 
We went in just to my ob -GYN and she diagnosed me with polycystic ovarian syndrome. They have no idea why I have it and I haven't been able to get pregnant. We've been trying for about three years now almost. We're all exposed to so many things without our knowledge and we end up with some type of health consequences like infertility or like cancer or like a learning disability and we're like, oh, why do I have this? You can't explain it by just genetics, right? Genetic drift does not happen in 20 years. So there has to be some type of other factor that's going on that explains this. And chemicals are certainly one thing that's gone up dramatically in the last 50 years. So that is a good candidate. You can go through a few classic examples of real mistakes, of major mistakes in which we allow these industries to get away with murder. Too many people are affected by this. We need your help. This is a safety issue. I'll be honest, I take offense when anyone would even insinuate that our industry is supporting uh, an increase in the body burden of chemicals. It does feel like somebody fell asleep at the red phone and it's been ringing. <laughs> If you're not outraged, you're not paying attention to what the hell is going on. When you tell right. Americans that the Chinese have better protections than Americans do, <laughs> they're shocked. We need a movement around this because that's how things get done. One, two, three, four, cut the chemicals, no more. We shouldn't have to wait to get cancer, a reproductive problem, for this issue to change. It should change now. And that one's called the human experiment. Yeah. That looks uh, fascinating. Quite a and I want to get this in yet. Yes, uh, please. Absolutely. White gold, the last one. So this is a sad film. Uh, you know, it's a bad thing to say because you know. But um, this is about uh, Kenya and the elephants uh, being decimated by El Shabaab. The filmmaker is coming from Kenya to this event, and he will discuss why he made the film and why he wants people to understand it. It's so important. And uh, we have some controls over what, what will happen to these beings, even from so far away. And so it's good to come and understand this. White gold, this is uh, also at the Environmental Film Festival, if we can run that. <laughs> Millions of elephants once roamed the African plains. It is now estimated there are fewer than 400,000. Elephants are known to possess complex intelligence. And most remarkably, they mourn their dead. This pregnant cow was sprayed with bullets alongside five more from her herd. This is the ugly truth of the ivory trade. We're having a slaughter of elephants. And the reason is China. The affluent new Chinese middle classes are now able to buy ivory at almost any price. And so there's a huge surge in ivory killing sweeping across Africa. We are not only losing elephants, we are also losing our men because these are professional gangs that we are dealing with. What's going on is happening on a massive scale. There are bands of notorious armed groups like Darfur's Janjaweed, the Lord's Resistance Army, and Al-Shabaab. This is a much more sinister force who terrorize people as well as elephants. We can say no to further illegal killing of elephants. We can say no to trade in ivory that is threatening the survival of the African elephants. Otherwise, Africa will be with no elephants in the very near future.
Again, that's uh, White Gold. One of eight films that you can see this weekend at the Environmental Film Festival. I want to thank uh, Dr. Ricky Stern, thank you. Thank as you always, for, for coming me. in. Again, uh, people that want tickets or want more information on how they can see the show. Sure. E-Action, E-Action.us. You can get through to the, uh, just click the festival tab and everything you need to know is there. Well, some looks like some great films as always and thank you so much for thank joining us again. Thank you for having again. me. You're watching Talk in the Neighborhoods. We're here tonight and every Monday night at the same time. We'll be back next week. Until then, for the entire staff and crew here at BNN, thank you for watching. Have a pleasant evening. Good night.